And first of all, I want to say I'm flattered to be asked to come to Google, and I'm also a little daunted because it's not often I walk in a room and realize I am definitely the least smart person here. So I will try to keep up. Um, uh, I did want to talk a little bit about um, the uh, incubation period for Simplexity, which was a long one. Um, I f the, the idea for the, first, for the book first occurred to me um, about 20 years ago when I was living in a uh, New York apartment, a one-bedroom New York apartment, and was something of a fish tank enthusiast. I had um, four aquariums in a one-bedroom apartment, which I suspect led people to refer to me as the crazy fish guy in 2F, um, but that sort of stopped after a while. But I was looking at, one afternoon I was looking at a small guppy-sized fish, these are guppies, but I was looking at a neon tetra, and I was contemplating it's surpassing in significance. It's a small clump of proteins that come together, that swim around for a few months, and when it dies, it, it, it returns to its constituent molecules within a matter of hours, if not days. You could go away for a three-day weekend and miss its whole lifespan uh, for practical purposes. Um, and I was comparing it to a star, which by any measure is infinitely vaster, infinitely more significant, infinitely more powerful. It projects its energy across galaxies. It lives for billions and billions and billions of years. And yet, what is a star? It's essentially a vulgar cosmic engine. It's three layers of gases that come together that don't do a whole lot more than collapse uh, hydrogen down into helium. It may burn for billions of years, and it may burn very brightly with enormous energy, but to what animating end? A guppy, on the other hand, is just this symphony of systems and subsystems, olfactory, auditory, reproductive, muscular, skeletal, social, behavioral, neural, metabolic, histological, respiratory, cognitive, visual, and that's just part of it. Those are simply the obvious things. Somehow all of this comes together into this exquisite machine that does these exquisite volitional things with even a shred of consciousness, though to be sure not too much. So the, the thinking was, or what I was thinking is forget size, forget lifespan. A guppy is really where the magic is. Um, at the time I worked for Discover Magazine, which was a highly, still remains, a highly geek-friendly place, but even Discover didn't see a whole lot of sizzle in a book on systems complexity, which was the best name I could come up for it at the end. Um, or at that point. Uh, so I knew that at some point I'd like to work on this and went off and wrote a, a number of other books over several years. And then finally in 2005 decided to write this book um, in, as an homage to my first insight into what made this meaningful to me. I was going to call it Praise the Guppy until my agent, the wonderful Joy Harris, the longest relationship I've ever had in my life practically, um, told me I'd be perfectly welcome to do that, but then the book would be filed in the, the ichthyology section in most bookstores. So she suggested I not do that. Um, uh, my concern in starting to do this was whether I would find a sufficient number of people who are actually working on complexity. Um, and in fact, there are a whole lot of people working on complexity at a whole lot of institutions around the world. But the true fountainhead of simplexity theory is the Santa Fe Institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, founded in 1984, somewhat modest origins, um, and uh, one of the co-founders was Murray Gell-Mann, the winner of the 1969 Nobel Prize for Physics, for his discovery of uh, development of the theory, we blacked out, oh, theory of quarks. Um, and Gell-Mann and his co-founders thought that if he could bring order to the swirl of subatomic particles that, that surround the essential elements of physics, so too could he bring order to the swirl of disciplines that surround all of the sciences. Galman talks a lot about how you define something as simple or complex. Um, and one of the things that, one of the best descriptions he likes to use and other people at, the, at, the, at SFI like to use is the idea of the complexity arc. This is somewhat of a gray reproduction from the book. Um, didn't quite have the pop in reproduction that I had hoped. Um, but the, the sense is here. Um, if you start at the far end with a room full of gas or air, imagine this room were empty. It looks like there's nothing here, but it's actually a highly dynamic place. There's this constant swirl of invisible activity as the particles and the molecules and the gas 
crash around, disperse into every crack and corner of the room and continue doing that indefinitely. Uh, it's a very, very active place, but it's also a very simple place. There's no order, there's no structure to it at all. Go all the way to the other end and say you could flash freeze a lump of carbon down to near absolute zero, which is the point at which atomic energy, molecular motion, is about the slowest it'll ever be. There's almost no activity there, and yet it's no more complex than the room full of gas. The only difference is at one end is chaos, at the other end is what complexity theorists like to call robustness. It's static, it's stationary, there's nothing going on. The true complexity comes as you climb the arc and the atoms organize themselves into something complicated and interesting, a horse, a car, a communication satellite, a guppy anything at all. The more, the, the, the more delicately you can perch on the top of that arc before sliding down the other side to something lumpish and frozen and fixed, the more complex something is. Now there are a lot of things that illustrate um, how this complexity arc operates in real life. Um, there's a fellow in New York named Sam Schwartz, uh, better known to the people who read his column in the Daily News as Gridlock Sam. And Gridlock Sam got that name because he coined the term gridlock back in 1980 when, excuse me, when uh, the city was preparing for the 1980 transit strike. It was Sam Schwartz who came up with the term. He was always credited with it. Um, and what he likes to think of is the way this arc plays out in the daily scrum of highway traffic. Now, if you have Cars on a highway at 3 o'clock in the morning, when there are, say, 50 or 100 cars on this road, it's very much like the room full of gas. It's chaotic. It's active. The cars can go anywhere and do anything they want. But what it isn't is terribly complex. If you have the lockdown of a traffic jam at the other end, it's more like the room full of, it's more like the lump of carbon. It's frozen. It's solid. <coughs> it's robust. But it's no more complicated than, than a... Uh, than the scatter of cars in the, um, when there are no cars on the road. The peak of the complexity arc is when you get to about 25, <coughs> excuse me, to 45 miles an hour, um, and there are 5,000 to 6,200 cars per hour moving past a fixed point. When you get there is the point at which cars move freely, but anything can change that pattern. A car tapping on its brakes, <coughs> But when cars move <coughs> at this point, what you get is anything. The tapping of a brake light can cause the, the pattern to gel into a fixed traffic jam. The best place to study this is on the streets of Manhattan. Manhattan is the perfect grid for studying complexity. The, the, the grid work of it, makes it uh, imposes a sort of artificial order on it. In Manhattan, in any day, you get a million cars coming in and out of the tunnels, moving through the, uh, the narrow streets of Manhattan. But at Midtown, there are only about 8,000 at any given moment, which means 8,000 cars out of a million moving from 34th Street to 59th Street and basically river to river. That's a tiny central core in all of the cars moving through the city. And yet that central core can determine <clears throat> whether the entire city is going to be locked into gridlock or not. And only a few hundred cars within those few thousand make that difference as well. What, uh, what Schwartz likes to, to point out is that when you have people, hold on, every few years, New Yorkers like to uh, argue for about 16,000 more hack licenses for, uh, for taxis in Manhattan because people get tired of competing for cabs. But the fact is, if you had 16,000 more cars in Manhattan, what Schwartz likes to say is all you would provide would be seating in midtown, midtown Manhattan because that's really all the cars would do. He also points out that in the case of true gridlock, in fact, only 60 percent, or the streets are in fact 60 percent empty because all of the activity is locked in the intersections with no cars at all getting downstream to mid-block. So basically you have no activity at all, which is a result of, of reaching that static end of the, of the arc. That's Sam Schwartz's favorite example of complexity. My favorite example of complexity is baby language. Now by any rights, 
speech should be something we're not able to do. Think about the numbers. We're born totally nonlingual. We're born simply with the software, simply with the capability, but we can't speak at all when we're born. By 18 months, you have a core working vocabulary of 50 words you can pronounce and 100 or so more you can understand. By age three, we have 1,000 words at our command and we're composing complex sentences. By age six, we have 6,000 words, which if you crunch the numbers means you've learned three new words a day since birth. Now, I'm, growing, I'm, I'm bringing my children up in a trilingual home. I can barely get past menu French. And yet at some point at this early stage in our lives, we're able to do these things. And now fluency requires 50, 000, a, a working vocabulary of 50,000 words. And that only includes formal dictionary definitions. It doesn't include fixed idioms like day by day, around the block, top of the ninth, end of the week, fending off, touch and go, buckle up, bun bundle up, buckle down. There's about another 50,000 of those idioms as well. What's more, you have to be able to master any one, or sometimes more than one, of the 6,800 languages there are in the world because you don't know where you're going to be born. So you have 6,800 different tongues <laughs> from Aboriginal to Zarma. These are just the A's and B's. And yet what happens a few years after that? This is what we're <laughs> left with. Now, something in the course of our lives turns the guy from the left to the guy on the right. This terrible tragedy takes place in the brain. The brain, this is, it's all a question of neural connections. Every cell in your brain is wired to be connected to about 15,000 other cells, which is what gives it its flexibility. As you get older, and older means six or seven or eight, some of those connections start to be paired away so that by the time we reach this age, we're down to about 10,000 per cell, or per, per connection, 10,000 connections per cell. Now you would, be think, you would think that being born with the capability to acquire language naturally without all the muscle work of memorizing tenses and verb tables and so forth, you'd think that would be a highly adaptive skill and one that we would want to keep. You would think it would be one that would be selected for throughout life. But the fact is there are a couple of things that work against it. First of all, the value of getting a language right, of getting the subtlety, the nuance, the difference between continuous and continual, the difference between gigantic and huge, which you can somehow intuitively feel, but you don't know quite how. The ability to break apart a sentence just stuffed with conditionals, like I would have done this differently if I could have known what I didn't know then. It's, you, can, you can begin to map that sentence, and yet it sounds right. You know it works. You know how it works. You just don't know why it works. That kind of subtlety and richness becomes more valuable than the parlor trick of knowing 5, 12, 25 languages, languages that you might not be able to use. Another important variable is that brain connections are metabolically very expensive. It takes a lot of calories to run your brain, more calories than it takes to run almost any part of your body. We were, from the start, and have always remained what evolutionists like to call a nutritionally marginal species. We live right at that, at our own tipping point, at the top of the complexity arc between starvation and gluttony. Now, in the US, we see what happens with too much gluttony. But in the world, and particularly humans in the state of nature, we've always been right at the edge of that. So it was too expensive to keep all those brain connections running. What we had to do was dial them back a little bit so that you could acquire enough food to feed the rest of you and to, get to keep your other basic processes running. So we pared down that capability uh, right at about the point in life when your main language or your main several languages are going to be set, which is age three or four. It starts to happen. Another way to explore complexity is sports. Now, no one denies, and the two big sports in the U.S., though basketball, particularly in a place like Boston and L.A., and particularly now, basketball is clearly the key sport, but the two most indigenous sports, if only because they're very much unlike a lot of other, most other sports in the world are baseball and football, and you can get a lot of arguments going about what the most complex of the two are. On their surface, the objectives are very simple. Nobody denies that they're complex games, but looking at the rule book alone suggests exactly how complex they are. 
Baseball's rule book has 10 chapters, 123 subchapters. Chapter two alone is devoted to definitions, an alphabetical list from adjudged to wind-up position, and it includes the helpful definition of touch, which is to touch another player on the uniform, on the uniform body and clothing, which is either a sexual harassment thing or something about putting the runner out at first. Football's rule book, though, is even more prolix. 18 chapters, two appendices, 89 sections, numerous supplemental notes. The sections are self-consciously and somewhat grandiosely named articles. There are 67 words devoted to defining the permissible size and color of the numerals on a jersey. And among the definitions is the definition of what a football, the shape of a football, which shall have the form of a prolate spheroid, measuring 11 to 11.25 inches and be inflated from 12 to 13 pounds. Um, the numbers, though, are what really strike me. At the beginning of a football play, every player in a game may assume three positions, off the left shoulder of the guy on the other, on the other side of the line, off the right shoulder, or nose to nose. The guy on the other side of the line may then do the same with him, switching off. Those are two people facing off one side to the other. When you have 11 people on one side of the line and 11 people on the other and begin uh, factoring these things out exponentially, you get 31.4 billion positions that are possible to assume before the play even begins. Once the play begins, we've got atoms in a room again. And once the game begins, you can substitute players. So you can take people out and suddenly just change one person here and you have 31.4 billion times three more. I don't even know how to do that arithmetic. Norm Chow, the, uh, the then um, uh, offensive coordinator of the Tennessee Titans when I was um, uh, researching this chapter said, so you begin with 31.4 billion combinations and you have a 22-year-old kid out of college. Explain those to him. He said, it's just, it's mind-numbing how complicated this, this can become. A similar, less kabuki version of this is, of course, warfare. And one of the wars that I think is the most fascinating to explore in this way is World War I. There were a lot of reasons World War I began. Um, Anglo-French -French alliance, the German expansionism, the collapse of two empires. But it didn't have to be fought. And with dispassionate negotiation, a lot of it could have been avoided, just as, it was, just as we avoided bloodshed during the Cold War. But there was bloodshed, and ultimately 20 million lives were lost. Now, what set this off wasn't anything of any significant magnitude. It was the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand <coughs> in Austria by, uh, in, Ser in Sarajevo rather, by Serbian national Gustav Princip who killed the Archduke on June 28, 1914, and set off the conflagration. However, Princip missed once when the Duke went past him, or didn't get a clear aim, so he never fired. Disgruntled, he went to a cafe to have a sandwich. He happened to pick a cafe that was on the alternate parade route of the Archduke. The Archduke went by the cafe, Princip finished his sandwich, walked outside, saw the Duke went, go by, and shot him. So in some respects, 20 million lives turned on Gustav Princip's sandwich. At least if he had not had it that time, that day, things may not have unfolded the way they did. Once a war does unfold, there's a lot that goes on on the battlefield. Now, military planners like to, to begin analyzing this with a little game they call Colonel Blotto. It's a back-of-the-envelope game that was sort of the precursor to the sophisticated war games that are now played out at the Naval Academy and the Air Force Academy in West Point with computer software. Colonel Blotto begins with the idea that, say you take two armies, Army One and Army Two, and they both have 100 divisions. It begins with the assumption, with the fiction, that numbers make all the difference. So the more divisions you have on the field or the more troops you have on the field, if, the, if you have more, you're going to win. So they divide up, they give two armies the chance to divide up 100 forces. Army 1 may pick 40, 40, 20. Army 2 may pick 34, 33, 33. They're both very sensible divisions. 
But in this case, Army 1 does better, wins 40 to 34, 40 to 33, and loses only 20 to 33. This could have been a, a, a dead draw, could have been 33, 33, 34, straight down the line, no, nothing would have, it, there would have been a stalemate. Instead, two win. Instead, Army 1 wins two, two battles. Now imagine that Army 1 had 150 troops and Army 2 only had 52. Um, Army 2 should get crushed. But what happens if Army 2 decides to concede Front 1, concede Front 2, and throw everything at Front 3? Suddenly what should be a rout turns into a 2 to 1. Army 2 is still very far behind, having lost two battles, having been wiped out in two battles, but they've actually knocked Army 1 back on their heels in a, a, a fight they should not have lost. This has happened historically. It happened at the Battle of Agincourt, or Agincourt, I've never known how, how to pronounce it, made famous in uh, Henry V. Um, and it happens routinely in history when very small forces defeat very, very large forces um, simply by deploying their troops properly. Another form of kabuki combat is, of course, political campaigns. Now, campaigns um, run very much on the simplexity arc. Elective, electoral campaigns run very much along the simplexity arc. On the left side of the arc, you can have, say, the scrum elections that took place in uh, Afghanistan in 2002, when you have dozens and dozens of parties trying to get a, a, a handhold of a new democracy, swarming the polls at once, and everybody votes at once and nobody knows who they're voting for. At the other end, the lump frozen carbon end, you get the lockdown of single party elections in China and any other dictatorship increasingly again in Russia. One is chaos. One is robustness, only in the middle where you have two or three or four parties, usually no more than four, vying viably for control of a dynamic government, do you get any kind of real complexity. But even then, even then, things can get far more complicated than they need to be. We may finally be down to two candidates, as of last night. But let's say you could have three. Let's say you could run a national three-way campaign among the last three people standing this year, Obama, McCain, and Clinton. And for simplicity's sake, let's say this is the whole United States here, Illinois, Ohio, and Texas. They're all roughly the same size. They all have roughly the same number of electoral votes. Let's pretend they have the same. So you win these, you win the election. And we will also, for simplicity's state, sake, posit that in this election, everybody finishes first in one state, second in one state, and third in one state, which could easily happen in an arrangement like this. So, who wins this election? Well, let's compare Obama to McCain. Obama finishes first in Illinois to McCain's second. He finishes second in Ohio to McCain's third. It's only in Texas that Obama loses, one to three. So Obama beats McCain. Let's see how McCain fares against Clinton. McCain beats Clinton second place to third in Illinois, first place to second in Texas, and loses only third place to first <coughs> in Ohio. So if, if Obama beats McCain, McCain beats Clinton, Obama's the president. But what happens when you pair up Clinton and Obama? Clinton loses to Obama in Illinois three to one, but she beats him one to two in Ohio, and she beats him two to three in Texas. So you have a situation in which candidate A beats candidate B, candidate B beats candidate C, and candidate C jumps back around and beats candidate A. This is three states, three votes, in an equivalent system, simplified about as far down as it can possibly be. Once you put in primaries and caucuses and hanging chads, the system should never work. The fact that it works at all, the fact that in the history of this country we've only had four elections <coughs> in which the person who won the popular vote lost the electoral vote is a testament to how, how dynamic and how viable this system can be, that even when everything goes wrong, it manages to fix itself. Consumer technology, we were talking a little bit about this at the beginning, is another example of how complexity can be very confounding. Take a simple point-and-shoot camera. These things are designed for anybody who doesn't know much about photography, which is pretty much everybody, 
You just want to take a good picture. That's all. You don't want the eyes to be red. If they have a button you can do that with, that's fine. Now look at what in a typical Canon camera you get. You have a 193 page manual. It introduces consumers to such opaque terms as their AE lock, their FE lock, their white balance, compression st settings, a stitch assist. I have no idea what that is. There are 30 different icons, like a flower and a fish and a face, for close-up portrait and underwater settings. There are six different variations on a lightning bolt and an eyeball for your different flash settings. All of this requires a flow chart and a reference guide and a three-page table of contents. Is it any wonder most people who buy a piece of, of hardware, cell phone, Blackberry, flat screen TV, <coughs> learn just one or two settings and then forget all the other things that they know they should be learning? The studies show just what this is doing to people. A 2006 study showed that consumers are willing to struggle for a bulky product for only 20 minutes before giving up and concluding it's either hopelessly complicated or that it's broken. When they return it to the store, 50 percent of the time the product's in perfect work, working order. It was just incomprehensible. Another 2006 study showed that 59 percent of cell phone users have to call tech support at least once in the first 12 months of owning a phone in order to get it to work properly. The average problem requires 1.76 calls before it work, it's worked out. Now that doesn't sound like much, but 1.76 is the average. Most people call more than once, and that's 1.76 calls per problem. And cell phones can have a whole lot of problems. There are a lot of reasons for this. The simple flexibility software allows, uh, that allows so many functions to be placed in a, key, in, in a single key is part of it. The other part of it is that designing software is such a rarefied field that requires such a particular level of expertise that it's a very, very narrow community of people who can do it well. Now, engineers who build bridges, people love to say engineers build bridges, but engineers don't build bridges. Architects design bridges. Engineers map out how they ought to be put together, and construction workers build them. And when an architect draws up a bridge, there's an engineer who can say, this ain't going to stand, or at least not the way you say it's going to, and here's why. I work with this material. I know what it does and what it doesn't do. And at the other end, there are construction workers who can say, you did it on paper and you've done it in the field. I'm telling you in this field, this isn't working and we have to fix this. With software designers, typically, though you guys know a lot more about this than I do, but typically, that's all compressed down into one job. So there aren't people outside to edit the work of the people inside, simply because no one knows quite how to do it. Um, there was a guy named Alan Cooper, a software designer and a, uh, a tech writer whom I interviewed for this, and he gave me one of my favorite quotes in the book, which is, in the computer world, there are two different kinds of people, those who are software engineers and those who are terrified of software engineers. <laughs> and that says a lot. Now compare the principles of computer design with another kind of machine, spacecraft. My first book was was Apollo 13, um, which I co-authored with Jim Lovell, a man I am to this day stunned and proud I can call a friend. I mean, there were 24 guys who can speak about the moon in the first person, and he's one of them. Um, this is Jim at a press conference in 1970 when he came back <coughs> from Apollo 13. Um, as you can see, there are, this is a model of the Apollo Lunar Module stack. This is the service module here, this long part with the engine bell. This is the command module, the conical part at the top where the guys lived, and this is a bit of the lunar module, the lander. Now, Jim, like all of the astronauts, had a lot of faith in the machines they flew, and he had a good reason to have faith in them. In the command module alone, the conical part at the top, there were 5.6 million components even if they operated with 99.9% .9 efficiency, that still meant there was the possibility, even the likelihood, of 5,600 breakdowns in that small piece at the top of the ship alone. And yet they weren't afraid. And they had every reason not to be. Some of these things could break down. A lot of them probably did. The reason nothing went wrong was the idea of redundancy. The first time Jim went to the moon, uh, first time any human beings went to the moon was Apollo 8. It was just 
this command service module portion of the spacecraft here without the lunar module. They went around the moon, they orbited 10 times, and they came home. Jim's wife, all of the wives, were terrified, as a lot of Americans were, that this thing wouldn't fire when they needed to come back. This is what had to fire to put them into orbit around the moon. This had to fire to put them, take them back out. If this didn't fire, they would have orbited the moon forever. There's no atmosphere on the moon. There's no such thing as orbital decay or not for millions of years. So any time you looked up at the moon, you would have been aware of a, an orbiting mausoleum. People were terrified of that happening. Jim said he told his wife, keep in mind, we don't have one engine on this ship. We have two engines because every single component in here has at least one backup system. The only thing that didn't have a backup system was a combustion tank in here where the fuel's mixed, which is basically a passive vessel, and the engine bell, which is basically a passive nozzle. Everything else had a backup system. There was almost always a way to get that engine lit if it didn't light. Now, even a, a system that redundant isn't perfect. Um, as Apollo 13 itself pointed out, there were, after all, two oxygen tanks on the spacecraft. When one failed, the other one should have survived but nobody reckoned on one blowing up with such violence that it would destroy the other one too. There were three fuel cells that were supposed to power the spacecraft. One fails, you have two. If two fails, you still have one more. But they were both, they were all three powered by the oxygen tanks. So when the oxygen tanks went, the fuel tanks, the fuel cells went too. <coughs> the, uh, for all of the, um, the scenarios they simulated, they never simulated that one because nobody ever imagined that it was statistically possible for so many things to go wrong. So in this case it did, but the reason we have sent people to space for 40 some years and have lost two crews in flight and only two crews is because these systems have been built with that kind of robustness and redundancy. A complexity theory doesn't understand, doesn't explain everything. It doesn't have all the answers. And I stress in the book that it's a very, very young science. It's sort of like genetics in 1958, four years after the discovery of the double helix. Once you know how genes work, it's, it gives you an interesting prism through which to refract what you know about how the human body works. But what it doesn't do is give you all the answers. <clears throat> but it does give you that kind of new view and I like to say that writ small or writ large or writ small or writ large again. I told you this is a beta test. Um, that it, thank you, writ large. Somehow the rhythm goes off after that. Um, that this uh, nonetheless gives you a fun new way to look at the world. So having said all that, um, I would love to take questions about anything and everything. Yes. So, given that camera with the 193 page instruction manual, what do you think is stopping some other camera company from having a much simpler one with a seven page manual? Do you think well, it's difficult to make something so simple? Well, no, it's not. Um, and the fact that, that we're working on Apple computers here do suggest that it, it does get done and it can get done because Apple does, as I was saying to Elizabeth when we were driving over here they do seem to have a sense that they design their systems in such a way that even if you don't know what you're doing, the first step you take to solve a problem is often the one that works. And if it doesn't work, it's often the one that takes you to the place where, you, where it's going to work. And they do think it through that way. So there are people who are designers who are able to do that. I think part of the problem is it's a little bit like the old stereotype that, you know, it's a long time ago that women going to formal balls dress for other women because men are too stupid to figure out what they're wearing anyway. They don't get it, so they, they dress to impress the smart people in the room who are other women. Designers design these things for other designers because I may, as a layperson, not get it, but the audience to which you're appealing does get it, and they'll know why something is diabolically clever, why something is ingeniously subtle, and those are the people you're trying to design for. Also, every feature on an overly complex piece of software is a result of at least one user asking for it. At least one user wants every obscure or arcane piece of, of 
stitch assist or FE lock or whatever these things are. So it's the need to over service everybody and the ability to over service everybody that prevents this from happening. And also, I mean, we are seduced by flexibility. We're seduced by the fact that, you know, you don't have a simple on off switch on a TV anymore that does one thing, turns it on and off, or a channel changer that does one thing, changes the channel. Every time you push a button on a remote control box, you're just operating a small piece of software, and software can do an unlimited number of things. So a 27 button box can control thousands and thousands of functions as opposed to, by definition, 27 functions, which is all it used to be able to do. So I think it's the, we're seduced by the subtlety of it. Um, we're seduced by the um, exhibitionism of saying, look what a complicated thing I can design. And we're simply seduced by the fact that, that people want these things. So people who design products give them to them. Oh, I, I imagine it's much less effective, much less easy to try to sell your product that way, um, simply because more and more people are demanding simpler and simpler things, and more and more people are looking, uh, looking for more stripped down things. One of the things that, um, that I get into in the book in a different chapter is the way this kind of flexibility affects, um, affects uh, efficiency in companies. You know, if you, if I have a line of four different models of Ford Mustangs I'm selling, and I want to sell a new sport model with chrome wheels and canary yellow paint and a sunroof. Well, that's great, but now I got to keep chrome wheels, canary yellow paint, and a sunroof in stock. I got to keep a lot of them in stock just in case people buy them. Suddenly, I'm making room for all of this inventory. Put a, 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 sound, a sound system package in, and there are three or four more components. Um, there was a study in the um, Harvard Business Review that I cite in the book, uh, in which um, a company that had become overly complex came to this consulting group and said, you know, we're just killing ourselves in inventory here. And the consulting group looked at all of the various products they had, all of the various option packages they had built into their products, and like the football team, found that a, ver a relatively simple line of products could, in theory, be configured 10 billion different ways the much leaner competitor that was doing better because its profit margin was bigger um, still could configure its products in 3,000 ways. And yet 3,000 different potential configurations for, for their products were far simpler than the 10 billion that the other ones did. So I'm not quite sure that answers your question. I'm, I'm certain it would be. Um, it's very seductive uh, for both marketers and for consumers to hear this product is easier. This is a true point and shoot camera and it does work more simply. Um, and I think that's the reason um, apples work as well as they do. Apples have sold as well as they do. They were always called the computer for the rest of us. And that was that, that slogan has long since not been used. But that was the argument they used, that we're not all experts. This small group of people is. And for the rest of us, this is how we can, uh, this, this is the computer for us. One of the difficulties in the technology field is people buy uh, often by uh, check marks. Does it have this phone of Bluetooth? Right. When you go to a T-Mobile site, I want a cell phone. There are a lot. Show me the ones that have Bluetooth, have right. the camera, and that narrows down the set. And there's no check mark for easy to use. That's so interesting. <coughs> That's you a very your hands on it to determine right. that. In Apple stores, for example, you can go in and play with. Um, an iPod to right. see, hey, it's easy to use. Right. If you buy it based on criteria you see only in a magazine or online, either you're reading a long article to find out it's easy, mm -hmm. or you just look at the check boxes. Right. And the check boxes sell things people don't want. That's interesting. That's a, it's, it's a good point. And I think what you, a, a place you see these things operating well in a model that could be used is when products are stripped down for kids. You know, think about the, the Firefly cell phones that are used for, I have a five and seven year old. I wouldn't give my five year old a cell phone. We'd get calls from Beijing. But I would give my seven year old a cell phone, particularly since you can program them for my number, my wife's number, her school's number, the police. You got four dedicated buttons. They can do four things. And you can unlock it, and she can actually dial her own call, dial her own numbers. But that's it. Now, 
My five-year-old would like that. My mother would love that. This is, you know, at both ends of the complexity spectrum, these things are very good. And a whole lot of people in the middle of the arc, though they may, might not admit it, would quietly buy the adult form of Firefly because that's really all they want. They just want to make a phone call and receive a phone call. That's it. So I do think if you start introducing these things at the end of the market that's most in need of extreme simplicity, there might be a lot of people who sotto voce would be buying them on their own and then you know, that would sort of introduce it into the market. Yes. So have you found that most complex systems have some sort of like stabilization property to them so that they don't, with traffic, if it stayed permanently in gridlock, then it mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily go back to the complex state. Or if it stayed permanently in you know, empty space where there were only five traffic people driving on a road, it would stay sort of in that random chaotic state. Right. Do, do most of them require some sort of well, I'm, I'm not sure entirely of what the question is that. Um, uh, Let me give a, a different sort of example. With spacecraft, mm -hmm. because they're so complex, you need all that redundancy, which increases complexity further. If you didn't have that redundancy, they'd break down almost immediately. So, so you do have to build in that, that stabilization. But software, I think we stick to it more in testing rather than the functioning right. of the software because it's a lot more deterministic. A line of code doesn't break. Right, it's either exactly. Wrong yeah. or, or it's right. And a lot of it has to do with the complexity of the individual units. I mean, one of the things that um, that one of the one of my favorite chapters of this book is about um, why it's so hard to evacuate burning buildings and and flooding cities. And one of the problems is that a lot of these models work very well if you limit them. The, the, the algorithms that model flowing water really do a very good job of modeling flowing crowds, which is why um, there's some thinking that a post like that, even if it was a non-load supporting post, placed generally in the way of a fire exit, not blocking the fire exit, but generally in the path to the fire exit, can actually be a very good thing because it breaks up the rush of people in the same way that a post or a, ca or the, a rock or a capsized boat in the middle of a stream breaks up the flow of water. So you get this hard destructive rush of water that suddenly gets broken into swirls and eddies and then every molecule, every discrete unit of water reaches point X at a slightly staggered state and that makes things flow more smoothly. So you do that with people and you actually get a better flow into the stairwell and you get more people out. The problem is, as one of the people we talked to um, pointed out, water molecules don't get scared and water molecules don't share misinformation with one another and water molecules don't have baby water molecules at home that they're worrying about getting home to. So once you factor in the variability of emotion and thought and, and foresight and planning, you exponentially increase the complexity of any system. Now, not all the components in a system have consciousness. Only, only humans and living things do, and only humans have highly sophisticated consciousness. But at all of these levels, units operate as a coherent whole, but the complexity within the units makes a big difference also. So it's one way of sort of looking at the levels of it. Sort of just answer this, but what, what are your favorite examples of either in, in products or in nature or whatever of very, very complex things that have been made to be very simple or appear very simple, and the reverse of that, very simple things that have been made to be incredibly simple? Those are really good uh, questions, and I'll tell you a few that I love. Um, this may only be because of the two small children I'm, I'm raising. But when you see babies, not just in language, when you, uh, when, when one of my daughters was just learning to walk. I was sitting on the floor watching her feet as she stood and she was standing and swaying a little bit as very small children would do. Will do. And if you watch her feet, you watch a baby's feet, there's a lot of subtle clenching that goes on of the toes. They're just reacting and you realize that that's a stabilization gesture. It's not a random twitch, it's a stabilization and it makes a lot of sense. You tense your foot and you're fine and people do what they call it subway surfing in New York. You know, you're always sort of keeping your balance in a subway. But think of the astonishing feedback loop that's going on. It's sensory, it's vestibular, it's muscular. There are signals traveling up to the brain. 
that are saying, here's the way the lower limbs are moving, how are we doing upstairs? And the upstairs is saying, well, it's teetering a little bit here, and it gets feedback from the vestibular system, which sends signals back down, contraction signals back down to the feet to contract them just so in a, a, a nanosecond. And then it sends back up and says, did that work? And the brain says, nope, not enough, and they clench again. And it's a constant unconscious feedback loop. Um, you see the same thing with, a, I was watching a baby walk across Park Avenue once with his mother, and it was a little toddler, and he had a bagel in his hand, and his mother reached out for his hand, and he put the bagel in his hand and reached up. And I was looking at that and thought, that took a lot. At this age, he had to know something about gravity. You can't drop it, or it's going to fall. He had to know something about the capacity of his grip. I can't hold both my mother's hand and the bagel at the same time. I have to know something about streets. They're dangerous. I have to know something about my mother. She's going to be furious if I don't take her hand. So all of these things get learned in that simple gesture. I open the book with, um, with the example of the Broad Street Pump. Um, I don't know, there was a, uh, another book out actually after I wrote this lead um, called The Ghost Map about this phenomenon. It was John Snow, the first uh, epidemiologist in 1854 in London, <coughs> who at the outset of a cholera epidemic in London um, was the first to, I mean, most people knew that cholera jumped around kind of unevenly, unlike, say, the flu, which will sweep into a community, it's airborne, it'll knock everybody down and move on. Cholera would hit people in a home and other pe not other people in the home. It was clearly waterborne. And John Snow was the first person to do aggressive epidemiological canvassing throughout London and trace all of the hundreds and thousands of cases of cholera that had struck the city to a single pump on Broad Street. There were 700 pumps in London to a single pump, or 70 pumps in that district, um, to a single pump on Broad Street that was pumping infected water. And every person in London who had come down with cholera in that current epidemic <clears throat> either took water from that pump or lived with somebody or knew somebody who had water from the Broad Street pump. He persuaded the town council to go down there with a mallet, knock that handle off. He knocked the handle off. The epidemic stopped cold. It was the, the, the complexity of, a, of an epidemic colliding with a very, very simple fix. And in that case, the complexity of the epidemic couldn't get through that choke point. So epidemiology is a very good example of how these things happen. Yes? I have another question. Sorry. Um, so it seems like there's a number of complex things that are actually quite popular, such as football, and um, people live in the cities, there's more urbanization, and everything else. So do you think simplicity is something people pay lip service to, but don't actually, that they want, that they say that they want, but don't actually want at all? that they're naturally drawn towards things that have a reasonable amount of complexity? Well, I think it depends upon what it is. People like the simplicity of football, and it can, it's, it's something that can be enjoyed at that level. But they also like the complexity of knowing that if I'm a connoisseur of the game, I can sort of, I can game it in ways that I can't other things. Um, I think it depends on, on how you look at things. One of, the, uh, one of the points I make is that it really depends where you come into a system. That's the, the uh, the, the degree to which it's either simple or complex. A handshake, for example, is the most retail of social customs. And it, you can stop there and say, I like that. I like the, 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 the directness and the, the, the understanding that says, I'm going to meet you. I'm going to shake my hand. We've just had a very simple social compact that transcends conversation and debate and argument and who are you and how do you smell and what tribe are you from and all the other kinds of data bits. We share that custom, we get it. We're in the same club. A very, very simple social transaction. Now stand back and look at the whole history of honorifics and head bobs and hat tippings and buy your leaves and forgive me's and pardon me's and all of the other things that that comes from and the fact that that was a gesture that meant I'm, my sword hand is empty and as long as you show me your sword hand and we grab them, we can both trust that they're empty. It comes from such a rich cultural tradition that there's terrific complexity there. All the way down at the other end, the muscular control, the optical control, the targeting that allows two hands to meet at a fixed point are very, very complicated. So I'm not sure this quite answers your question, except what it does say is that you like it, you can appreciate it at different levels. You know, one thing I was saying um, 
before we sat down is that you know the, the one of the the misleading things about simplicity and complexity is for example if I look at an Apple computer which is very easy and intuitive to use by my lights um, I applaud its simplicity but the very fact that its front end is so simple means that there is tons of hidden complexity within it that make it that simple at the front end. On the other hand, if I talk about a DOS system from 20 years ago, my old leading edge computer, I say that was very complex because it was very hard to use, but in fact its guts were very simple, which is what made it very complex. So it was, that was simplicity masquerading as complexity, and in the case of, of a Macintosh, it's complexity masquerading as simplicity. So it really is you like what you like in something. Somebody who's a software designer may love Macs because they love to get inside and fool and fiddle with the guts and, and understand how it works. I, as not a software designer, like it because of its simple front end. So that's really what you're looking for. We need to stop there. Jeffrey has to catch a plane, but thank you. Thank you all for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.